So I appreciate all of you being here and for your engagement and your time and, and your, as I said, your sort of sincere and authentic engagement on this. Enjoy the lights, John, <laughs> such as they are. Uh, Dr. Hernandez was a last minute addition that does not appear in the program, but we thought that she offers a really unique perspective on healthcare and in the system, and so we're honored to have her as well. But John, I'm gonna start with you as, uh, uh, as you say, relatively, being relatively new to California. I know, I know someone else on stage who is more new to California than you. Uh, that would be me. Uh, uh, California healthcare, at, at any rate. But you have a long history of health plan leadership and engagement and dealing with reforms at, at different levels. We had an opportunity to have dinner last night and I asked you a similar question. Uh, you may or may not be as candid with, with a few hundred extra eyes on you. Uh, but how is California unique in how it approaches healthcare and healthcare transformation compared to the other states like New York where you've had similar leadership positions? Mm -hmm. Well, the most striking feature about the uh, California landscape and delivery system is the role that the uh, provider groups, IPAs, uh, medical groups take, which are delegated entities to health plans like ours. Um, <clears throat> I think the more prevalent feature outside of California is that uh, if you do have a medical group or an IPA, it's, there's one and it's an exclusive arrangement and that sort of thing. Here, the multiplicity of these delegated entities um, and the amount that is delegated to them is remarkable compared to what I see elsewhere. Uh, and there are, as I've observed so far, pluses and minuses to that. So that's a distinguishing feature and I think the role between the health plan, the delegated entity, and the provider needs recalibration. So we have a clearer value, a clearer idea of what value is being added at each layer. And I think we need to ask the hard questions about is, if there is no value, then what do we need to change? Because the dollars available, particularly for a plan like um, LA Care, which relies solely on Medi-Cal funding and some degree Medicare funding. Um, in the, as the ACA settles in now to more of a steady state, much of the money that accompanied the implementation of the ACA that was to help bridge people into coverage is going away. Mm -hmm. And we're going back to more of a steady state of funding in terms of the usual sources and aren't gonna have all of these additional funds anymore but now we have millions more. I mean, there are almost 12 and a half million people in California who are now in Medi-Cal. I mean, that's almost a third of the state. Um, so we are going to have to fund a much bigger program going forward. And I think the most serious discussion that needs to happen in California is a um, discussion with the, <clears throat> the legislature, the providers, the people, about what is a sustaining long-term funding formula. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have one. I mean, the recent battle we're having with the MCO tax and whether we get the 1115 waiver or not, yes, those are important issues today, but they aren't long-term solutions. And I think we need a more, a more serious dialogue about how we're gonna fund this going forward. So Senator Hernandez, that, that gets right into your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to sort of maybe talk through your thoughts on funding of Medi-Cal, but before you get there, I thought I'd ask a question uh, because this kind of question came up from our convening panel as we were putting together our, our, our topics, which is uh, it must be very hard for a health policy leader like yourself in the legislature to talk with other members who are not as well-versed in healthcare uh, who, who don't have the years of experience on health policy that you do. And when it comes to questions of funding, when there are other competing demands, it, it, it must be very hard to make the case that healthcare needs more investment. How, what is that like being one of the most important leaders in health policy in California, uh, trying to convince your caucus or, or the Republican caucus to come along with you on, or the governor, to come along with you on, on some of these policy or fiscal right. challenges? So, yes, I agree that um, for me, healthcare is the absolute most important thing. That's the reason why I ran. 
But the reality is the way we govern, uh, the individuals who are elected are a reflection of who we are as a people. So you don't have everybody that has a health background. You have somebody that's a lawyer, that's a teacher, that's an advocate from the left, from the right. And what happens is those individuals have priorities that their absolute most highest priority. It could be education, it could be transportation, it could be water. And what makes it so difficult to govern in California is its size and its diversity. And so, you know, I may believe in this issue, but when I try to convince them, they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 they'll listen, but they have their issues that are just as important, if not more important to them. Now, what makes it difficult, and we, we will go, obviously, I want to talk a little bit about the cost. And I think you made a comment earlier that there's enough money, not enough money in the system. I believe there's plenty of money in the system. The problem is it's not distributed properly. So the entities that need it the most, like whether that service the poor, aren't getting enough uh, of the revenue source. So that's, that's the difficulty. The other, and I made a comment earlier in the other um, um, forum that I was in, here's the problem that we have with healthcare in California, the dilemma, is when, especially when it comes to funding the poor, those that need the services the most, Medi-Cal and communities of color, it requires additional revenue or a shifting of that revenue. And the problem is the electorate that votes is willing to put money everywhere else except poor people. And that's the dilemma we have. And that's why it, it's such a tough political, you're shaking your head because it's true, the electorate doesn't, you know, they'll vote for increasing taxes for education. That's great. But I don't know if they'll vote to increase their taxes to pay for somebody in Compton to get better health care. You know, yeah. that's the hard, that's the dilemma. And that's what we have to, to fight for. So yes, yeah, we need to increase Medi-Cal reimbursement rates, but when it comes down to, well, I wanna raise taxes for water, I wanna do for roads, I wanna do for infrastructure, I wanna do for education, I wanna do for higher education, I wanna do for, you know, prisons, you know. There's a lot of people at the trough looking for the revenue. Yeah. So that's, that's the frustration and dilemma we have in California. So LaFonza, as one of our event sponsors, SEIU 2015, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, and, and you all at SEIU have been clear from, from day one that in your view, there ought to be more of these sort of cross silo conversations. And uh, We heard this morning from uh, the former head of the Oregon Health Authority that, uh, that won $1.9 billion in their federal waiver for about a million beneficiaries did some pretty amazing, pretty cool stuff. They've got numbers to back it up. Not even they included long-term care in their transformation model. Does it feel like long-term care that you know, you're always just trying to get at the table, you know, and talk with, to be part of the conversation? You know, it's, it's an honor, one, for this conversation to be happening in Los Angeles in this moment and for SEIU Local 2015 to, to be included in the conversation. Um, yeah, we always feel like we're scratching to be a part of the, of the discussion. Um, you know, I, I think, as probably one of the younger people in the room, uh, nobody wants to think about getting old. Uh, and it's hard uh, to uh, think about what that means for not only the individual, but also their families. And, you know, but the truth is, 10,000 people a day in this country turn 65. We're living longer because of advances in medicine. Uh, there are uh, more uh, complicated health challenges now. You know, we have more people in the state of California being uh, diagnosed with autism and the impact that that has on families and moms and dads. Um, and you know, as the union that represents 315,000 long-term care workers, uh, mostly in-home supportive services workers as well as nursing home workers, we have a simple theory that we believe uh, that there is enough money in the system, uh, but that we have not looked at the system as a whole. And that when we uh, start to look at the system as a whole, we will find uh, the efficiencies uh, and see some of the uh, choices that we made in silos. Here's an example. We have, take the uh, person in Compton that Dr. Hernandez referred to. Let's call her Mary. Uh, Mary is, uh, uh, is uh, 
uh, living with diabetes, Mary is living with obesity, Mary is living with hypertension, all manageable chronic diseases, but all diseases that drive up costs in our system. Mary is also, let's put her at 72. Mary, because she is a uh, low-income person of color, has an IHSS worker. Her IHSS worker is with her uh, 180 hours a month. She may get an opportunity to see her physician for 15 minutes that month. But that IHSS worker is not connected to her physician, uh, to her case manager, to her pharmacist, to anybody that is thinking about her wellness, but her IHSS worker spends more time with her than anyone else. Could not we imagine a system where the IHSS worker is um, helping her ma maintain her medication compliance, making sure that she gets the appropriate exercise that she needs. As she drives her to the store, maybe she would decide to park a little farther away so that Mary could get some extra steps in that day. There are simple things that we could do just by bridging the connections. And that's why we felt like it was so important for, for long-term care workers to really be a part of the conversation that the state of reform is, is carrying, carrying on. Some might believe that, well, the Affordable Care Act is uh, in place and it's settling in and reform is done. Uh, we feel like there's still reform left to do as we have not bridged the gaps between the silos in our health delivery system and 80% of healthcare dollars are spent in the last two years of life. And if we're going to maintain sickness, uh, that's a choice that we should make. But I think we want to actually be healthcare providers and keep people healthy uh, and well and participating actively in their community no matter how long they live healthy and also hopefully well, right? We, have, uh, we will have microphones available so you all can begin preparing your questions as, uh, as the entrees come out. Uh, and we'll call on you. I'll just sort of keep an eye out for our volunteers to, to raise their hand. Uh, Sandra, you know, we have four, but, but if we don't count yourself, three relatively progressive voices in healthcare, if you think about the national spectrum of, of discussion and dialogue, three relatively uh, uh, progressive voices up on the stage. Uh, I think we have a number of folks in the audience that would consider themselves pro-reform. Uh, you're at the California Healthcare Foundation, you're engaged in healthcare, but you're still outside of the direct day-to-day -day business of healthcare, in many ways at least. Do you think that healthcare can fix itself? I mean, is healthcare so complicated and, and in, a, in a market where price is set by market leverage rather than quality, uh, do we have to have regulation and legislation to get to reform? Or can the market get there on its own from where you sit? Well, um, first, really nice to be here. I appreciate uh, uh, being invited. Um, I, I would say that um, all reform has to take place within a market perspective, and markets are very local and very regional. I was struck by the Oregon conversation earlier this morning. Um, but um, I don't think the market itself and the drivers that are in the market will get us to the kind of integrated delivery system that spends dollars to get um, both uh, better outcomes, um, but also that spends dollars to improve the fact that one out of every three Californians is eligible for Medi-Cal, many of them largely because they're poor. And so, you know, I think Senator Nunes' comments were really on point in the sense that whatever the size of the general fund budget it is, um, the trade-offs between what we do in job development and in preschool and early childhood education and K through 12 and post-college access and what we spend in a very fragmented system of care um, does not either provide Mary a better quality of life or her family a better quality of life or better outcomes. So. I think you have to have the data to understand how the market is working. You have to understand what Medicare is doing and what the direction of CMS is in. 
Um, but I, I don't think that's by any means sufficient. And I think the foundation's view of this is that uh, you know, we're a California Healthcare Foundation with the goal to try to improve the care delivery largely for low income in California. That's our, our mission. And, uh, and really staying in the lane of delivery system, uh, really trying to promote all the efforts. And again, I think the Oregon scenario is very powerful. It is about global budgets. It's about a community coming together and putting all their resources together having the data and information that informs what the decisions are going to be. And then it takes extraordinary leadership to say, you know, everybody says lower costs, your costs, not mine. Right? My costs are legit and the services I provide are legit, my hospital, my clinic, my whatever it is. It's somebody else's costs. And I think the, the powerful message is when we are not Oregon, we're not as homogeneous as Oregon, we're not as small as Oregon, you can't put your arms around it the state quite like you can in Oregon. But I think the elements of leadership, which I think is really important, and we certainly have it in the legislature, but we also have it in communities and hospital systems who are beginning to realize that running hospitals is not the end game. Yeah. Um, and so I think you need that kind of leadership. I also think, and we think that uh, consumers need a lot more information, including low-income consumers to understand what their choices are in markets, to understand costs, to understand what a copay is, to really understand how to navigate this new card that says I'm entitled to comprehensive care with good outcomes, because yeah. that's what Medi-Cal should be about. So I'll just ask you a direct question. You can answer with whatever kind of answer you'd like, direct or indirect. What do you think of the quality of Governor Brown's leadership on health care? Well, I think that uh, it was very important for the legislature and the governor to decide to expand Medi-Cal. Um, there was a point in time, I think the senator would agree, when that was unclear whether that was going to happen. And uh, that is profound. I mean, it, it has a profound effect on the state. Uh, it is no, by no means sufficient to where we want to get in terms of outcomes and quality of life in our communities and particularly in low-income communities. So I think we have to look at that as the opportunity that it is. Yeah. He's an education governor. Everybody knows that. And in as much as education should, over generations, remediate poverty, and we know how poverty contributes to the costs in our healthcare system, you could, in a macro level, say, okay, he's making a big, big bet in education. We had underfunded it for a long time. Look at our policies in incarceration. I mean, those are outrageous. Yeah. Outrageous policy, a 30-year policy of incarcerating people at extraordinary rates uh, with absolutely no return in any way, shape, or form on, uh, on either communities or families or uh, you know, whatever outcome you want to say. So I, I think... Expansion of Medi-Cal was very important for the state of California. There's a lot of work to do to make those dollars work better. I'm in the camp of there are plenty of dollars. We don't spend them in the right way. Yeah. Um, so that's how I'd answer that question. Good. John, um, you know, it's hard for good policy to be made uh, or good markets to function well. Uh, without adequate information and transparency and sunlight. Mm -hmm. And as we discussed again last evening, it, it, from my perspective, it seems like health plans typically have more data than anyone else mm -hmm. and are typically uh, more hesitant and reticent to share that data mm -hmm. uh, uh, than many. Not, not maybe than more, most, but than many. Um, you know, why, why, why is that? <laughs> and I know you can't speak for all health plans, but uh, you know, nor, the, nor would I want to. <laughs> but this question, I know you've got a great answer for it, which is why I'm teeing you up, because it's a good answer, and I think it should be highlighted. Uh, but don't we need, as a general rule, more and more and more data of all kinds to be able to have a fighting chance of making the market work well? Well, I agree with you. We do need more of the right data, because we're also drowning in data, and we're creating a lot of... Um, information that isn't particularly useful that we have to wade through. So we have to be, be careful about it. But 
I think for many health plans, particularly those that are commercial uh, or um, for profit, they view data as part of their proprietary uh, net worth, and I think they guard it that way and are, uh, think about it very carefully before they release it. Um, on behalf of LA Care, we are a public entity, nonprofit organization, and um, since I've been there, we have begun to share data with our delegated entities about their performance uh, in terms of various quality measures and access standards that we're held to as the Medi-Cal plan. And as our delegated entities, they have to adhere to the same uh, standards. So we're beginning to share information with them about how they're doing relative to each other so they can begin to see oh, gee was maybe I'm not doing as great a job as I thought I was. And I think that's incumbent on us if we want high performance out of the uh, providers and their organizations. We have to give them the feedback so they can do it. So I'm all for more information. I'm also for making sure it's actionable data that's meaningful because we can also get lost looking at stuff that doesn't provide any help because there is yeah. so much data out there now. Yeah. So Senator Hernandez, uh, with data can come empowerment if there is data literacy, right? When I look up my uh, stomach ache on WebMD and decide I have cancer, that may be a misuse of, uh, of data. And in the all pair claims database or in the consumer centered data conversation, one concern is that consumers won't know how to adequately use some of the data that a, a database would present. How do you bridge the gap between making sure there's good data available for anyone and also improving health system literacy so people know what to make of that? I don't go screaming, I got a stomach ache and you know, therefore I have brain cancer. Right. So yes, uh, transparency is extremely important. And just to follow up on the first question, the question that was asked earlier is, you know, we're creatures of habit and the markets weren't set up and the plans aren't set up to share the data. And now that we are post Affordable Care Act where we're requiring everybody to purchase health insurance, I think it's incumbent upon government to make sure that this now is transparent and we have a transparency with regard to our healthcare system. But it's more than just posting, and by the way, I've ran several bills to look at all payers database, whether it's you know, privately funded, government funded, nonprofit, but I still think it's an extremely element to looking at how you control healthcare costs, because now you're gonna see the inefficiencies. But it goes even further, in which you, I wanna um, follow up on what you said, you also have to tie that to outcomes. Because if you don't tie that to outcomes, just because it costs less, Maybe they're not as efficient and their outcomes aren't as good. So they need to be judged on a similar way. And because healthcare has changed, we have to change the consumer's mind as far as how they're gonna be shopping for it. Mm -hmm. For example, if you were to go buy a car, you're not gonna walk into the dealership and buy exactly what the dealer tells you. You're gonna go online, you're gonna check prices, you're gonna find the best deal, you're gonna negotiate. And I think that's where healthcare needs to go to because we, at the end of the day, are going to have to change the mindset of healthcare. We're going to have to, unfortunately, see more patients at a lower cost, more efficiently, and have better outcomes. And they have to be held accountable to those outcomes. And I think the next thing in healthcare change is changing from reimbursement rates to charging and paying to keep people healthy. That's where healthcare needs to be going. Do you think uh, this is? A different topic, admittedly, but and I, I, I recognize you may want to be uh, diplomatic in your answer. Do you think that? Do you think that the waiver decision, the the, the six point two billion dollars that was awarded uh, off of an ask of about seventeen billion uh, to ask of CMS, do you think that the administration misstepped somewhere? I mean, is that, that $6.2 billion a letdown in some way? Or is that a reasonable number given where California is? You're talking about our waiver or you're talking about Oregon's waiver? Because our, our waiver. 1115 waiver decision. Our yeah. waiver is a lot more than $6 billion. I think it's like. Well, they just came out over the weekend. So it's, it's cutting, it's really pretty, pretty new news. Yeah. So we asked, or California asked for $17 billion, uh, but it was determined to only be 6.2. And, 
And that is new news, so if I'm catching you off guard, I apologize. Uh, but it does seem like... It's not enough. It does I seem agree. like yes. it's a little bit of a letdown from what I'm hearing from people. Uh, maybe Lafonza, do you have an opinion that you, you, you I, have I, on that? I, 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 yes. Um, I, I think it absolutely is a letdown when you think about uh, the 1115 waivers um, sort of uh, intention funding our public hospitals. And you see, see that our public hospitals are going to be the backbone of access for these 13 million new Californians that are in uh, Medi-Cal. I think the $6.2 billion doesn't do enough to keep our public hospitals whole, let alone keep them competitive in the market. Does CMS just not understand the good work that California wants to do? Or did the California administration, the Governor Brown's administration, just fundamentally misstep? I, I think there is uh, lots of responsibility to be shared. Uh, I think that there's, um, it, it's complex uh, yeah. uh, uh, to understand California. And you can't compare a waiver negotiation or a set of outcomes that may have happened in the waiver of New York or Texas or Florida to California, we have a very different public health care system okay. uh, and than, than those states. And I think that was hard for the new CMS administration uh, to grapple with and manage in the time that they had to get to a, a waiver outcome for California. You know, I also feel like the, as a state, we missed opportunity to pursue innovation. Uh, we have, you know, as I said, I am a, uh, you know, a, a, I believe a relentless advocate on the inclusion of long-term care uh, in our healthcare system. We need to develop adequate workforces uh, for the populations of the future. Uh, there are going to be you know, tw 20 million seniors in California by the year 2020. We don't have the infrastructure to prepare for that. We don't have the workforce uh, to deliver the kind of care that's going to be needed. And I, I th so I think. There were opportunities missed to innovate and prepare, not just for the moment that we're in, um, but for the future that our uh, state that our that our state will be. Uh, and and I think that there was some uh, uh, the bigness and diversity of California is complicated uh, and and hard to understand from from Washington D.C. You know the the dual eligible population is tough for everybody. And managing not just managing the care coordination, but but figuring out how to manage that programmatically and systematically is tough. So, how's that going? How's the CCI dual eligible project going from where you all sit? From where our state's providers sit, um, not as well as we would have liked. Uh, we were. Uh, uh, strong advocates for the CCI program, and we think that it is the right policy. It's one of those uh, places and opportunities uh, that where the policy intention is is right. It's the execution and the uh, largeness of our state and the diversity of our communities and the uh, fragmentation of our system that has sort of gotten in the way of what all of us would have hoped would have been a much more seamless uh, uh, execution. Mm -hmm. um, our members, uh, if, if not for their organization, would have no information about the uh, Coordinated Care Initiative, what the intentions of the Coordinated Care Initiative are. Um, I, I think that you know, if we could all, and I believe from talking with for with health plans, with people uh, in the state agencies, if we could all sort of start over, mm -hmm. uh, we, we would, we've learned a lot. Uh, I think uh, the plans have learned a lot about our members yeah. uh, and uh, the communities that they, that they work in and, 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 and that they live in. And you, know, you can't create a nine page enrollment form for a monolingual Korean speaker that is not relevant to their language of origin. Um, and those are some of the simple challenges and simple mistakes uh, that were made in the rollout, and we've just got to work our way through it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just note, uh, John, before you jump in, I, I don't see anyone standing. So if you have a question, I miss you. Uh, our microphone folks, make sure that you're waving so I, I see you. I think the dual eligibles are an excellent example of what we've been talking about 
in terms of is there enough money in the system and the general consensus is there is, but it's in the wrong places. The duals are an excellent example. We have nine or 10 million of them in the United States today. And yet we're operating these two programs, one at the federal level and one at the state level, trying to figure out through these demonstrations how it's gonna to work together. I've been in it in both the, mo the demo model we have in California, I did it in other states, and I've done it when it's been outside of the demonstration model. And it's tough to get these two programs aligned. So if it were up to me, I'd be saying, then why don't we get rid of it and have one program for a dual, have it done at the federal level, call it Part E, and claw back from the states their Medi-Cal contribution to it, and have one set of benefits administered by one agency so that both the beneficiaries and the plans that administer it are not constantly confused and wasting resources on duplicate reporting and supporting duplicate procedures. It's a waste. Interesting. And to LaFonza's point earlier about Mary and Compton, two-thirds of the nursing home beds in the United States are paid for by Medicaid. Medicaid is not two-thirds of the population in the United States. So we're disproportionately using the most expensive resource to take care of people, and I think it's largely because it's a default mechanism. They've got the coverage, let's put them in. We know from studies that have been done in other states that if we divert people from custodial placement and provide the care at home, we can do it and probably save about $40,000 a year over the cost of that person being in the nursing home. There will be certainly cases where people need institutional care. But my contention is if we had better care management and integration of both the benefits and the care for the dual eligibles, we could probably reduce that nursing home occupancy on custodial care, save 25 billion on the process. The nursing homes could fill those beds with skilled patients, which would relieve the clog in the hospitals because there's no place to put somebody who doesn't need acute care anymore, but needs a step down. It would be a win-win for everyone if we could harness the political will to do that. You know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to use the cliche that that makes too much sense. Uh, I'll because be it does seem like a, a party, I mean, that's a very interesting, a very interesting proposal. Um, DC is not the place I think of when I think of the word innovation or progress. Uh, in fact, the opposite opportunity may be true in the 1332 waiver in 2017, which could allow a blend of mm -hmm. Medicare and Medicaid within a state-based yes. model. Right. What about the f sort of same <clears throat> logic of unifying the programs, but at the other end of the spectrum, where Medicare would be rolled more into a state-based program, or, or more of Medicare would be carved in to a state-based program? Um, I'm really gonna get in trouble with this. Um, you're creating 50 opportunities for mischief. I would rather see it at a federal level. Yeah, interesting. Sandra, how about, I, I, I think this is a very interesting question, and I'm not, I don't wanna put you on the spot if you haven't given a lot of thought to this, you but. You already put me on the spot, I, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, this question, I think, of unifying these lines of business into a more singular uh, payment model where you could have more financial integration and hopefully more care integration. Um, sounds like progress to a progressive voice and sounds like single payer to a conservative voice. Um, maybe sort of two questions. One, do you think it makes sense to roll these two programs, Medicare and Medicaid, to say nothing about the commercial space, which we'll leave for a different topic, but rolling Medicare and Medicaid in together, does that make sense? And, and just maybe a question on the exasperation of the political rhetoric that, that we see today and how it shapes our policy discussion. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's completely a personal opinion, but um, if you were gonna take a white page, you would look at global budgets, um, really wrap everything around the outcomes that you want, build the workforce that you need, utilize everybody at their scope of practice to the maximum ability, use a lot more health care extenders, create a lot more jobs. I mean, you could do that. Um, 
the, the political environment, uh, I mean, the, the question on the waiver is fascinating, right? It's a lengthy negotiation on a lot of different component parts. So did anybody drop the ball? What's the ball, right? Um, I do think that uh, the opportunity for innovation, and California has done a lot of innovative work. We're just nowhere near where we need to be. And in many cases, the innovation that's happened has started in California, at least, in the county space. And I would argue that the waiver kind of gives us that opportunity to do that. And so I, I guess I'm a pragmatist. I don't see us in a single payer um, in, in our lifetime. I think if you were going to do a blue sky and start from a blank page, you would design it very differently. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, you know, the nature of the waivers was to be able to create innovation. And I would argue that the biggest wake up call on the waiver, and I, you know, I, when I was director of health in San Francisco, county hospital was under our purview, as was mental health, as was substance use, as was all the primary care. And I could just tell you, and by the way, so were all the public health functions, all under one, still today, all under one department. And you could barely pay for a family planning staff person on a CDC grant because you were funding this massive operation called San Francisco General Hospital. And I, you know, I train there. It's an integral part of an academic center. It serves a very, very uh, uh, high acuity, low income population. And, and I work there one day a week. It's an incredibly inefficient place for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And so our public hospitals are anchor institutions in our community from a lot of points of view. And we have to run them a lot better than we do now. And they're a very key part of how we think about these integration of systems, public as well as private. Um, and thinking about the kind of innovations that have happened out of counties and scaling them up, I think is the work that foundations do and try to support and try to help the state to do. And uh, we have, you know, the, now the dish do dollars are going to be reappropriated in a different way. I remember living off dish dollars. So um, I guess I, 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 I don't know how to answer the question whether Medi-Cal and Medicare is ever one big yeah. single payer. But what I would say with one out of three Californians in Medi-Cal and our aging population demographically, um, we're in a state federal funding scenario here. And so aligning as many of those dollars and policies as possible and regulations that allow us to do things in a more convenient, timely way at the right time and pulsed registries that allow people to know what their end of life wishes are and be able to honor them. I mean, there are so many things that the state has contemplated and is working on. Um, that I think you need to continue to move the innovation forward, uh, keeping in mind that there are all these arcane regulations between these two programs that do make it hard to look at communities and look at the outcomes we're trying to achieve collectively. I, I will just tell you, uh, as, I, as I turn to you, Senator Hernandez, but to, in response to your comment, uh, Sandra, that um, I ask these questions knowing there's no easy answer, you know, and it turns out I think that that is the state in which we all operate today in healthcare, that there's no easy answer. That's certainly the case in the political environment where there's, there's not enough money to feed all the mouths that are asking for it, so to speak. Um, Senator, what advice would you give to this audience of, of you know, market players in South, Southern California? You know, they're all experts in their field, but when it comes to not just influencing policy, but doing their job. From where you sit as chair of the Senate Healthcare Committee, what would you tell them to keep their eyes on and, and to be thinking about as they do their day-to-day -day job in healthcare in California? So my advice is that, number one, we need to make sure that the implementation of the Affordable Care Act is successful. But more importantly, not only is it successful that we control cost, and not only that we control costs, that we make sure that we control costs and provide care to the most neediest, the vulnerable communities, to get that care, and that's a big part of controlling cost. And, but here's my, my biggest recommendation and advice, is because 
we are now in a world where we are requiring everybody to have health insurance. And now that the consumer is going to be required to have health insurance, if they don't have a product, because they're looking at this as a product that's affordable, this is through Cover California or a large group, then they're going to demand it. Now you have elected officials that are going to be having their constituents, and that if the market doesn't control itself and control the cost and outcomes and transparency, then I see that the legislature is going to have some type of rate regulation put upon the marketplace. Interesting. So that's, that's what my advice would be, is that the market itself has to make sure that it works, it's successful, because the consumer is going to demand it. And the and, and government will respond. To and government demand. will respond. And yeah. that's just the nature of how we govern. We respond to our constituencies. Right. You know? Great, great point. A very interesting point. Sandra, I'll ask you the same question a little differently, but, but from the philanthropic perspective, what advice would you give to these market and policy folks as they are going about their job? What should they keep their eye on? Um, well, I do think that it is not just that um, consumers are shopping for a product. They, they actually need to be able to afford in their time, waiting times, transportation times, but also uh, in co-pays and deductibles in all the sectors. Uh, there is more onus now than there ever has been, both not only to have coverage, but also to be able to maximize its use, not just to protect your assets from bankruptcy, albeit that's an important protection, but um, I do think that the system has to get much simpler. The information that we convey uh, needs to be a lot clearer. You could have a PhD and you get your benefits and bills and people trying to sort it out. And you know, people bring me bills all the time and say, I don't know what to make of this. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think we have to simplify and I think we have to be, keep, you know, it is true, we built a delivery system that services physicians and medical groups and hospitals and entities. It, it really was not designed with the end user, let alone a low income, stressed with all kinds of other issues population and we, we, we should not redesign anything with their perspective not both at the table and helping us redesign it. Yeah. Anytime we have done that we've done a lot better than if we tried to do it uh, abstractly with a bunch of folks who well informed, know the regs, know the details, but w the systems are going to have to be timely, easy to access, a lot more affordable. And, and I think from an accountability point of view, we owe better outcomes. So Lafonza, I'll ask you a, a similar but slight, slightly varied question. I'm interested in how your experience in labor, in labor politics, and in long-term care would inform the advice you give to this crowd that is largely not labor, and largely not long-term care. What, from your experience, would you convey to them as advice for them to keep their eyes and ears on, or eyes on? I mean, I, 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 my opinion is just to that question is going to be very sort of focused in on workforce development. Um, when you think about uh, the population that our country is. Uh, that it's going to be living in our country and living uh, in our state, we can, uh, I would suggest to the audience that we have to make decisions and make plans about 10 years from now, not about today. Uh, and the workforce that we are going to need, what, and, and what that means, right? It's, we can't, the, a lot of the stressors that are created in our uh, health system also come uh, or derive from the poverty in which people in California live. And so as you're thinking about workforce development, think about what it takes uh, for a, a family of three to actually live and survive in California. Try to design uh, your um, uh, systems to, to meet the workforce that the, the, that, that the uh, population of the future is going to need. 
uh, and also the quality of life that you want that workforce to have uh, and the impact it would have on your system. Yeah. So John, I'll give you the last word. You've been around uh, a lot of these conversations, policymakers, market leaders. Uh, what advice should this community in Southern California hear from you based on all of that experience? Join LA Care. <laughs> no. Uh, Welcome to California. I, it was a, too much of a setup. Um, well, there's a host of, uh, of issues to deal with, but I, I, I want to go back to the thing I said earlier. In the long run, the community has to come together to figure out how to fund Medi Cal on a long term basis. And my comments about consolidation was just for the duels. The state should run their own Medicaid programs, but where you have both the programs, that's where I was saying there was integration. So I think it's really we've got to come to, um, because that is going to affect the access issue, and then it's incumbent on the plans and the providers to work together to make the system more integrated and efficient. And we do need to come to the state and the feds and say, here are the tools or regulations we need to do that more effectively, because if we don't, as the senator pointed out, you know, government abhors a vacuum and they'll come in with a regulation for us. So I think uh, my, my message and goal would be to let's have a robust discussion about how we're going to finance this now that we've got a third of the state in this program. Wonderful. Let's give them a round of applause.